Acts chapter 2. It's a very pivotal chapter. So today, rather than just grabbing your hand and rushing and plowing through it, we're going to take a lot of time setting the stage. One night, many years ago, I was watching a political debate on TV, and I was riveted at the time. I think it was, it was a Ted Kennedy and Mitt Romney. So it goes back to 1994. And I was watching it and my wife asked me if I would take the garbage out to the shed. And we had a big backyard fenced in and the shed was way back there. So I'm like, sure, I'll get it next commercial. And then when the next commercial came, I grabbed it and I went out to where the shed is and I put it in there. And then as I was running across the lawn, it was, it was dark and for some reason, I don't know really why, I just, I guess I just didn't want to miss anything. I took off. Like I didn't just like jog, I sprinted. And I was accelerating toward the house and in route between me and the porch was a little red wagon that one of my children had <laughs> left out there that I didn't know about. And it sounded like a car wreck. It was colossal. I hit it at full speed and I tumbled and it tumbled. And as I walked in, you can imagine my sympathetic wife with tears of laughter <laughs> asking me what happened. And I had this huge welt on my shin and she, she said, well, why would you run in the dark? Who does that? <laughs> I think a lot of us have done something like that in our lives in, in, a, in, our, in a spiritual sense where we've taken off in an area where we probably shouldn't have or we've been bowled over by an unforeseen obstacle. Maybe, you know, you're on familiar ground. So when we're on familiar ground, you feel safe. I mean, I know my backyard like I know the back of my yard, you know, there's like... <laughs> Now, maybe if I were somewhere else, I would have been careful. I mean, who would run through someone else's backyard without knowing? You know, often we think we know what we're doing. And when we think we know what we're doing is when we tend to make those mistakes and when we tend to get hurt. And I think a lot of us Christians are guilty of the same thing. So often, we're doing things. We operate in the strength of our ourselves. We operate under our own power, our own strength, our own limited resources, our own limited intellect, instead of learning what it means to be learning to draw from the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. See, for many people, it's just a, it's something they hear, but it's kind of a mystical thing. It's a weird thing that some people say, but you know, it's a reality that we need to understand. And so often, we tend to forget that God has gifted us with so much. Imagine going through some extreme to give somebody you love a gift that you know will change their life. And then when you do, it just sits on the shelf. See, God has given us the, the gift of his Holy Spirit, and we need to understand that. Now, Acts chapter 2 has proven to be a very provocative chapter. One of those chapters that tend to divide the church into different camps. You know, some of gifts are for today. Now, others are like, well, no, gifts are not for today. And even now... There are probably some of you thinking, who have read ahead and know where we're going, I wonder where he's gonna go with this. I wonder which way he's gonna go. We might have to leave the church after today, right? If he takes the Baptist route, us Pentecostals are out of here. If he takes the Pentecostal route, us Baptists, we're out of here, right? If he takes the Bapticostal route, then we, he's wimping out altogether. <laughs> It's divisive stuff. Now let me begin by saying I, what I believe we need to take is a, the biblical approach. Now everyone will go, of course, Don. Everybody says that. No matter where they are, they say they're taking the biblical approach. Maybe. But we need to parse our way through this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
reminds us the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner, the word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Such a great verse to really you know, dive into and drill down on. So we have to use the word of God as our measuring stick. That means we are, what we're not going to use as our measuring stick is subjective experience or denominational loyalty. We're going to go with the word here. The word will sort out the soulish from the spiritual. We're going to spend a fair amount of time on this in the next two weeks because the, the Holy Spirit, is, it, and what happens, it's going to be a reoccurring theme in the book of Acts. That's why today there's a, a little more setup than usual. We're, Lord willing, we're going to cover 12 verses, but next time we're, we're going to dive a little deeper. But let me just start off by answering this. I do believe in spiritual gifts. I believe in the practical application of the Holy Spirit that equips us to bear witness of Jesus. In fact, not only do I believe in it, I depend on it. Otherwise, it would be the me show, and I don't want that. And the Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus. So what I want is when we gather together, I want us leaving, looking at him. Then I know it's a work of the Spirit. I would not expect God to bear fruit in this ministry in any other way. Any spiritual work that's been happening here, as you know, it's not by our might, not by our cleverness, clever, clearly, um, <laughs> not by power, right, but by his spirit. But with that said, when it comes to the topic of spiritual gifts, gifts, I seldom see a biblical approach. In fact, I often see more emphasis on emotion or emphasis on uh, gifts in a way that draws attention to the believer. And really, the last thing I want is this to be some sort of spiritual pep rally. I don't want your souls fed with cotton candy and you leaving on some sort of sugar high and then when life whacks you, you got nothing. That's, that's not the way I want it to be. So we need it to be a, I, well, I don't want it to be a pep rally. Before the 1938 Rolls Bowl game between Michigan State and USC, the well-known coach named Go Get Em Yost, one of football's most colorful coaches, gave an inspiring speech to the men. He said, this is the most important game of your life. When I count to three, I want you to run through those doors. I want you to fight for Michigan State. I want you to play for your mothers, for your wives, for your girlfriends. I want you to win for the glory of Michigan. One, two, three, go. And the team stood up and one man charged out the door and they all followed. And the only problem was that the coach had accidentally pointed to the door that led directly to the edge of the gymnasium pool. And the team bust through the doors and 13 starting players ended up in the water and they had to postpone the game for a half an hour. And you know, this is what happens if we're going to validate a spiritual experience based on emotion. Yes, when the Holy Spirit grips you and works through you, it can be a very powerful, even emotional thing. But you don't use the emotion to validate it. We don't want a pep rally. We don't want this to be a soulish thing. We want it to be a spiritual thing. You know, a lot of times people in church, when they talk about spiritual gifts, you know, it's like they, we all like the sounds of our power tools, but, you know, we're not really building anything, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> we run in the dark, and then we're blindsided by little obstacles that wouldn't have tripped us up if we were walking in the light of His Spirit. God's gifts are real. God's gifts are good, and God's gifts are perfect. But when we contaminate them with our pride or our lovelessness, then we're just running in the dark. 
Now, for those of you who are new to the faith, Acts chapter 2 is all about what we call the birthday of the church. And there is much to be said. That's why we're taking our time. We're only going to cover the first 12 verses. So uh, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the wording here is worth mentioning. It says, when that day had fully come. There's a, the, the word there, sumple roo, literally means to fill completely or to be entirely fulfilled. So in other words, it's talking about a specific prophetic fulfillment. This isn't another holiday. This isn't another Pentecost. This is the Pentecost. This is the fulfillment of that holiday, just like Passover. Remember, Jesus said, I desire, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover. It wasn't another Passover. This was the fulfillment Passover that we call the Last Supper. And just as that was, you know, Pentecost, this is, it says, when it, this one had fully come, this is it. One of the three feasts, Every year that all Jewish men were required to come to Jerusalem, you see, to, uh, in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, 34. They would go there three times a year. What this means is that there were a lot of Jewish people from all over in Jerusalem this day. It was called Pentecost because that means 50. It celebrated 50 days after the Passover. It's also referred to as the Feast of Weeks. Why? Well, because it occurred on the day after a week of weeks. Remember, they, they go by sevens. So seven sevens is 49 days. So after a week of weeks, then boom, you have 50. You have Pentecost. Jewish tradition tells us that it was the day that the law was given to Moses by God. Which would mean, on the Old Testament day of Pentecost, Israel received the law, and on the New Testament day of Pentecost, the church received the spirit of grace in fullness. And there's a holiday that even precedes this. Three days after the Passover, we have the Feast of First Fruits, which is interesting because it depicts the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. And that was at the, uh, celebrated at the beginning of summer. They would have the summer harvest where they would offer up the sheaves and, to God, you know, recognizing that it was him who was really providing it, so they, they give him the first fruits. I'm saying all of this because when the Holy Spirit falls on the church in that day, full, our Lord is bringing the first fruits of the gospel. This is the fulfillment. This is where it begins. That day had fully come. This is a, a huge moment in time. And now we're going to see the first fruits of the cross. The dawn of the church age opens and there's a harvest of 3,000 souls on this day. The first fruit of that. It's just a, a wonderful prophetic fulfillment. Another point that I want to hit on are that these guys are together both in one place, I mean literally together, but also in one accord. They're united. It is important for the church to be together. I know I have heard many tell me, and I'm sure you have heard the same thing. I love God, and I can worship Him wherever I am. I can worship Him on the golf course as I'm embracing His majesty. I can worship Him Sunday morning fishing in the mountains, catching beautiful brook trout, and I can just worship his creation. And I get it, and I understand that. But sometimes I wonder whether someone who says that stands when it comes to obedience. If obedience is important, then going to church isn't as optional as they would want you to think. We need to be together in the church. We need to be in one accord because we need to have others around us that will encourage us. This is what the Bible tells us. This is the benefit of being part of the body. We're to encourage one another in the Lord, provoking one another to love and to, to good works. Reminding, sometimes with me, it's just a matter of reminding me what I already know. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's what we should be doing. We're gifts to one another. It continues, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much more as you see the day approaching, which is all the more relevant today. You see, we have a role that we're called to play in each other's lives, but if we really don't care to know one another, then how important will it be for us to be encouraging one another? That's not the way the body works. The body's supposed to walk in unison, in unity, animated by the head. When a part of the body does its own thing, that's unnatural. We call that a spasm, right? When the body walks in unity, then it advances as is desired by the head. So we want to be encouraging one another. We have to have a degree of unity. We're, we're called to be gifts to one another. And when we choose to gather together in his name, that's when amazing things happen. God's going to honor that. Okay, so the stage is set. They are waiting upon the promise as the Holy Spirit moves upon the people in the new way. But I got two other points I want to remind you of before we jump in. Good food for thought. Number one, we need to remember that Jesus has already given many of them the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 22. After the resurrection, after he appears to them, John writes in John 20, 20, when he had said this, he had showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I'll bet they were. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what do you think happened when he said, receive the Holy Spirit and breathe on them? I think they received the Holy Spirit. I think it's interesting. Um, many of those who are about to receive the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 2 had already undeniably in some way received the Holy Spirit. And the next point is as, as they live in the power of the Holy Spirit, that is going to be what changes everything. I will bet at this point, now that Jesus is gone, they're beginning to recognize their emptiness. And that's a good thing, because you're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit when you're full of self. And we're going to see how Jesus unites them, just as he unites us as his Spirit works through us. The event that we're looking at in the upper room is quite literally the opposite of what happens at the Tower of Babel. When they unite outside of the will of God. What happens when man unites outside of the will of God? Confusion. What happens when they unite within the will of God? Unity. So, there was a lot of setup. Let's, let's go back here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Boy, that's a lot of stuff in one verse. The first thing I want to hit on, though, is that this is a work of God. This is a God thing. I cringe when I see people try to whip up other people in some type of emotional frenzy in order to receive some type of spiritual experience. We need to understand, God is the initiator. We are the responder. We don't set the stage and say, okay, God, now. No, it doesn't work that way. So this is a God thing. I want it to be of God. I don't ever want it to be in question 
whether God did a work in me or if my flesh was kind of manipulated through a spiritual pep rally or some training that they, the people that they taught at the church, you know, how to lean them back and, and knock them in the spirit and offset their center of balance and all these clever little tricks that come with it that some people literally do. No. I want it to be unequivocally, undeniably that you know that this is God working in your life. Okay, so what's going on here? Suddenly there's this sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it fills the whole house where they're sitting. So first we get a sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Now, I don't know if it actually got windy. As you know, I got a pretty active imagination. So I see robes flapping and hair flying, people getting sandblasted, pottery falling and smashing. I don't, I don't think that's actually what happened. We don't really know, but I do know this. It got really, really loud. Can you imagine being indoors and a sudden thunderous like wind noise? We remember the sound of Ian, right? That, that howling, that hurricane, that, you know, just screaming, category four, whoosh, just screaming. And that was outside the house and it was loud. Imagine that being inside the house. That's pretty weird. Filling the house, a sound from heaven. And in some ways it's really weird, but in other ways it makes a lot of sense. Many of you are familiar with the Greek word there for wind. Right, uh, Nume, where we get like pneuma, where you get like pneumatic tools and things like that. It's, it's the Greek word for wind. It's the Greek word for spirit. It's the Greek word for breath. It's all one and the same. The breath of God, the Holy Spirit on them, a mighty rushing wind. It actually works the same in the Hebrew, as you may know, right? We have ruach, which is the same thing. is spirit, wind. We have abram experiences God, he's Abraham. We have Sarai, who's Sarah, right? It changes. So it kind of makes sense. Here, a sound from heaven, is the source of it is the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples. Quite a significant event. This is the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church. Now it's important to say that the Holy Spirit doesn't always work this way. We can't recycle it or set it up so, you know, we're waiting for Pentecost here, right? It doesn't work that way. Um, with Elijah, he had a gentle blowing. It was completely different. I think it's wrong to take or think the Holy Spirit is going to work the same way every time. In fact, later on in the book of Acts, we're going to find not a sound of a mighty rushing wind, but an earthquake when we see Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, and when they had prayed, the place was, oh, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word with boldness. Later, we're gonna see people get filled with the Holy Spirit without any weird phenomenon like earthquakes or, or wind or stuff like that. I say all of this because beware of theologically formulaic approaches to things. Formula is something that babies drink. And we Christians tend to like formulas. You know, we want it all set up. We want to experience. This is what needs to happen. No, God is not going to work the way that we prescribe for him. He is the Lord and we are not. So first they have something to hear. Now they have something to see. Verse 3, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. What a weird, mind-blowing idea. Your translation might say cloven, tongues of fire. And the word there, divided cloven, um, diamerizo, means to cut into pieces and distribute. We see it used in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35, when it speaks of Jesus, it says they crucified him and they parted his garments. They took it apart. So it's as if this fire comes down, that's not apparently blown out by the wind, and divides itself among the people. This is something completely new. Now here's a, a thought. 
fire seen in the Old Testament uh, in, in worship was a way that the sacrifice were consumed on the altar, right? The, the animal was consumed, burned up in the flames. Likewise, the Holy Spirit kind of does the same thing in our lives. In other words, when the Spirit's really moving, He consumes the me and leaves the him, if you will. Maybe not the best way to put it. But that's what ends up happening. Fire kind of burns away what is temporary. Fire leaves what will last. It's kind of like the same principle with the wood, hay, and stubble and the gold. It gets, you know, judged of the, our works that we do as the, as, the, as the Lord. It goes before the Lord in his eyes of fire. He, he sees that and our works are judged up. Only the... the, the, the the precious things remain. Uh, everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. It gets consumed. In other words, when why we do what we do will be seen for what it really is, right? Uh, getting a name, the favor of men, all of these different things. It's all temporary and they poof up in smoke. And a lot of people are investing their lives, validating who they are, even in ministry, in things that don't shouldn't really matter. And what ends up happening is when the judgment day comes, it just goes poof up in smoke. The Holy Spirit has a way of purifying. So the Holy Spirit's not just uh, um, for, for power, but for purity. And I need that. So we have the wind to hear, we have the fire to see, and that's all awesome but that's a temporary manifestation the real gift is that they were all filled with the holy spirit that's the real event so i'm not i don't sit in my office in the daytime waiting for an f3 event you know um or little fireballs to pelt me but i'm telling you we can experience the holy spirit we can be filled with the holy spirit and i need god to do this in my life because if i'm left to myself I'll find trouble. All I got to do is nothing. All I got to do is be me. And uh, not only that, I will naturally avoid any pain that God might want me to grow through. And many of you can testify that the greatest time of spiritual growth in your life was pain. Pain is the shortcut to spiritual growth. We, we want to take, I, I want to, not in the natural, I want to take the path of least resistance, right? And so we have this tendency to want to blend, like, like Peter at the fire, right? At, at the enemy's fire, just blending in, hoping others don't really see him and call him out. So the Holy Spirit, it not only leads us and protects us, but he will purge us and clean us. He will make us holy. Cleansing is necessary. But I must say this, cleansing can be very very uncomfortable. Many years ago, I was on my honeymoon and my wife and I went to Moxie Falls, the highest waterfall in Maine. It's a beautiful place. And, and well, there was an incident there and, and in order to save my bride from plummeting down Moxie Falls, I, I ended up cutting my foot up a little bit and it got infected. And then later on, we went to Hampton Beach. That's where I was, New, in New Hampshire. And we were walking along at nighttime, and I, I had a little limp because my foot was infected, and I wasn't really tending to it because I was busy, have, you know, honeymooning. <laughs> and um, as I'm walking along, I, I stubbed my toe. But I, I really stubbed my toe. And I took the entire top of my big toe off. Like a, like a flip top. It just went whoop and it was just this little thing and then it came off and it was... So now that's dirty now because I'm walking around barefoot and infected foot and now the top of my big toe is lopped off. We go back to the room and uh, I'm, I'm going to take a nap. And I, I do and while I'm sleeping, oh, while I'm sleeping, Florence Nightingale decides that she's going to <laughs> cleanse my wounds. I have my foot elevated a little bit because of you know, the throbbing stops. And she, I don't know if it was, I get it mixed up. And you guys might know. You have mercuricome and you have methylate. Whichever stings the most was the one that she found. 
And she starts dabbing these things on the side of my foot where they got all cut up. But let me tell you, if the top of your toe is off, it's like a, a wick. It's like a candle. She, she's dabbing it on there and it's just sucking it all in. And I'm in my peaceful slumber and then all of a sudden, my foot is on fire. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I wake up like, yeah, what is going on? And, she, and then she's all shaking and she's like, oh, oh, I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> it was actually a good thing. Cleansing is necessary, but it can be very, very uncomfortable. And when you have your encounter with God, he might bring you to a place that you choose not to go. Lord, I've been avoiding that all my life. I've been keeping that closet door closed. And he might say, it's time to pull that skeleton out so we can move forward. Therefore, many resist the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to remind you that the Bible clearly shows these same individuals in the book of Acts are going to get filled over again. That's worth noting. Remember the last verse I quoted earlier when they prayed the place was shaken and they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness the same people some of them so I say this because I must respectfully reject the once filled always filled philosophy or doctrine that is taught have you been filled with the Holy Spirit as if now that you've hap that's happened you're operating on a higher level from that point on if I was filled with the Holy Spirit 20 years ago, that doesn't mean I am equally as full now. But I still have the Holy Spirit in me, however, and that distinction needs to be made. That earnest, that down payment that every believer has, the Spirit of the living God residing in you, that distinction needs to be understood. So now these guys are speaking in languages that they were never taught. And they, as they, they're speaking these languages, as the Spirit gives them utterance, right? It's spiritually generated, not soulishly generated. It's the Holy Spirit giving out each utterance. And the interesting thing we see in verse 11 is what they're saying. It tells us that they're speaking of the wonderful works of God. That's what they're talking about. Now, I want to share a little bit, a couple of key points here concerning the tangling topic of tongues. And I know many will disagree with me on this, but I believe this is clearly what the Bible teaches. And that is this, scripturally speaking, tongues is a language that is addressed to God. Follow this. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Right? Prophecy, forth telling. Now, we always, when we hear prophecy, we think of mm, me telling you a future event. That's, that's foretelling, and that can be prophetic, but prophecy is forth telling, speaking forth the word as God gives you that. Anyhow. Desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Get this in verse 2. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation to men. You see what he's saying? He's saying prophecy is the more excellent gift because it's going to edify the people around you. Pursue that. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So 
As Paul is explaining the benefit of prophecy over tongues, he's saying here that tongues is directed at God and not men. Now that flies in the face with a lot of teachings that people have experienced and taught, in, often in a lot of our Pentecostal churches. They have this formula that tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. But honestly, I don't see that taught in Scripture. Now, I don't want to come across as critical or hyper-spiritual, but if and when God gives me a word of prophecy, something that is burning that I need to share with somebody, I would just take that person to the side and share it. Why add a few extra links to complicate things? For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but speaks unto God. Here's another point. It's a message that you yourself don't understand. Right? Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So it can be a known language, a human language. We, we see the mention the unknown language of angels. Here we see it's a variety of human languages. At least that's what it seems to be, unless there it's an angelic language that somebody automatically, like it's a divine universal language, that no matter what your language is, you're hearing it and understanding it. Perhaps, I don't know. But what it seems to be is a variety of human languages. And Paul says, I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and if I have not love, I've become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Sometimes we see people or we hear of people speaking in tongues and, and you say, well, what's the spiritual purpose of that? I see three main purposes in Scripture. There are others, but I'm three main for the believers. And that is prayer, that is praise, and that is personal edification. Now, prayer, so there's sometimes... I, I just don't know how to pray. Sometimes I'm beside myself. Sometimes I need, I know I need to pray about something or sometimes something is so impressed on my heart, there's, there's this urgency and yet there's just a loss of understanding. The Holy Spirit knows how to pray better than I do. Romans 8.26, Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For when we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes my words are just falling short. The other reason is praise. Sometimes you might be overwhelmed with God's presence or God's goodness. You know, you, you have that season where you're breathing in and you're breathing out His grace and you realize the omnipotent God of the universe loves me and has taken care of me. I am understanding the power of grace and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And as I'm praying, sometimes words, they just become a barrier, not a bridge. My words fall short. Oh, God, you're so good. Pizza is good. You're beyond good, right? My words just don't, don't, they just fall short. My pinheaded mind can't express the magnificence of the eternal God that I'm experiencing. My, I'm trying to funnel it into a conceptual, it, it's just not working. It's beyond me. It may happen concerning the depth of gratitude. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 17 that it is an excellent way to give thanks. And the third one I said was personal edification. 
which we already read in 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So how does this build a person up? Well, it's a level of prayer, a level of worship that surpasses something we otherwise wouldn't experience. Right? They're letting the Spirit work directly through them, learning to trust in His work. The big question is, are the gifts of tongues for today or did they end at the apostolic period when the Scriptures were completed? And before half of you get up to leave, I'm going to answer that next week. But I'm going to answer it in detail as we go on. Because I want to look at both sides of that topic from a scriptural perspective. So back to verse 5. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So God-fearing people from all over, Jewish men from all over the world, guys who really take God seriously, the men who want to be pleasing to God, and they're there, and they hear this noise. Verse 6, when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So they hear this roaring wind, and they're drawn in out of curiosity to see just what is going on and they hear people praising the Lord in their native tongue. That's wild. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed and they marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Galileans? Remember, those were the northern folks. Those were the uncultured people. These are the backwoods people from Hicksville. And yet they're speaking eloquently and fluently in all of these other languages. It's like, what is going on? It's like, what does this mean? Verse 8, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they're all hearing this. Now, I think many mistakenly interpret this incident in Acts chapter 2 assuming that the disciples are using tongues at this moment to preach to the gathered crowd. But a careful look shows us that's not exactly what's happening. This is praise to God for His wonderful works. Remember, tongues are addressed to God, not to men. There was a common Greek language and Peter will use that shortly to address the crowd and preach the gospel to them. And there'll be a, quite a harvest. But that seems to be missed often. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And that is the big question, and the rest of the chapter is focused on answering that question. Now, I know this is a divisive topic, and I know many of you were brought up sincerely believing differing perspectives, but I encourage you to study this for yourselves. Don't believe what I say just because I say it. Study to show yourself approved. Look at the other verses. Now, with the whole tongues issue aside, I do want to say this. God wants us to be filled with His Spirit. I believe that. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, not to be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but instead to be filled with the Spirit. Many times, we're kind of running on vapors. Right? We had a spiritual high. We, we had something. We, we read a scripture, and it, we just like connected the dots, and we're like, I get it now, and, and that's glorious. But that was a while back. Now it's my bad self calling the shots again. Temptations are coming. 
Right? We don't want to run on vapors. God has more for us. The problem is we insist on doing things our own way. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it says this he spoke of the spirit which had yet to be given. I think a lot of people in the church settle for less. I think God wants us to experience his spirit to a fuller dimension for many of us. Listen to the words of our Lord. I talked about this a little last week, but in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, Jesus is speaking, and he says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And a lot of people use that out of context for a different Thing, but what's he talking about here? Well, hang on, let's keep reading. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Right? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Right? Of course not. Listen to his conclusion. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... Here's the question. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Wow. Man by nature likes power. But God's Spirit is the source of His power in our lives. And that's what we need. And I believe that He wants to give it to us. Not to intoxicate us with power, that's pride, but to enable us to fulfill a glorious calling. I know that many of you have turned on the TV and watched some crazy Holy Spirit freak shows and side shows and crazy stuff like that. But I believe that God wants to equip us to fulfill our calling. And He does that through the Holy Spirit in our lives. And being filled with the Holy Spirit in our lives is not about an emotional gush or how high you could jump, or who can yodel the loudest waiting for a translation, or whatever it may be. It's about how straight you can walk. Amen. A spirit-filled life will give us stability. Our life will back up our testimony because we're being purified. We're being a vessel unto honor, fit for the master's use, and others are seeing that. Not some sort of emotional fix. Let's come to church, get plugged in, do some sort of hallelujah thrill ride and go home and, and just be our bad selves again. I think many have been settling for less. And the question is, do, do you want to be, you know, do you want more? Right? Do we thirst? And not thirst just for like, I, ooh, that sounds exciting. I think I want in on that. No. <laughs> thirst to be like, Lord, I know that if I do this, you're going to purge me. You're going to prune me. Pruning hurts. He's going to say, what about this? Let's take this out of your life because that's hindering growth. There's this purifying thing. But a lot of us, I think we're just falling short. And the question is, have we been asking? Right? Do, we, do you think that God wants to have you experience Him in a greater dimension? And if you do, just ask Him. You know? Earnestly, keep seeking, keep knocking in the context of what He's saying. Don't just say, okay, Lord, fill me. Nah, didn't work. <laughs> it's like I said, I've stood in a ride for 45 minutes to an hour for a six-minute roller coaster ride. But when we get in prayer, after three, four minutes, if nothing happens, we start squirming. <laughs> we can wait for a thrill ride, but we won't wait upon the Lord. You need to understand the access that we have to go before Him. Access. It's incredible. You know, when we were at the other church, whenever I finished a sermon, usually some people want to come up, time of prayer and stuff like that, which is awesome. But my children 
always seem to just have no problem taking cuts in front of the line. Hey, Dad, can I go over so-and-so's house for lunch? Right? They have access. They understand. To them, they, they don't even think twice about it. You have access to God. And he wants you to experience that reciprocity of his spirit bearing witness with your spirit. And to be filled full. And, and I know it sounds punny, but it is truly fulfilling. And that's what we need. And that's the light that's going to, we want this church to, to make a difference in our community. We want our lives to make a difference in our sphere of influence. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, in the lampstands in the book of Revelation, chapter one, those lampstands, they're, they're the church and they're fueled by oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And then we find out that we are the church and Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So what do we need to be fueled by? The oil of the Holy Spirit. That's where it's gonna make a difference. Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you for your amazing word. We thank you for your amazing plan. And Lord, as we venture into some controversial waters, there are certain takeaways we can be absolutely sure. Lord, help us, Lord, not to major in the minors, but help us, Lord, to focus on you. We desire to bear fruit we want you to be glorified in our lives. We want to walk in the power of the resurrection. Lord, we need to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit, knowing that sometimes it's a beautiful, overwhelming experience of how much your divine love is. And other times, it's a purging. It's a painful reality of something we've been avoiding, but you want to set us free. You love us too much to see us limp with that. And so often, Lord, we've been just settling for less. So Lord, you know every heart here, you know that you know everything there is about us, Lord. And we don't want to fake anything. So Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that anybody here who thirsts, that you would honor that. And may we just thirst for more of you continuously every day. May we not buy into denominational loyalties. May we just be into your word and see what it's saying and say, Lord, I long for more of you. We thank you, Lord, for the, the, the soul-saving gospel that you loved us, that you went to the cross to pay the price, and that we marvel that we can have our merit of a righteous standing before you because we know how wretched we really are, that amazing grace that saved a soul like us. We know. We know our thought lives. We know the things we've coveted, and yet you love us so much that you sent Jesus. And so, as we believe in him, we're not going to perish. We're not going to live eternally in a marred state. But you will restore us unto that day of the fullness of redemption. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for the work of the cross. We pray that you would fill each one of us, Lord, and that we would see you working through us as we learn what it is to yield the totality of our being to your perfect will as we decrease and you increase and we have the joy of seeing eternal fruit around us and we thank you that we can do this through your power because you made it possible in jesus name amen